Good morning, Woodland. Are we having a good time? One more time. Are you having a good time? I mean, when you came in the doors today, did you get a hug by some of our awesome greeters? Yes, some, someone over here did. I'll tell you what, I love coming to this church. I got about a dozen hugs before I could walk through the, through the hallway, and I got some coffee. So just appreciate all of our serving teams in this church for being the hands and the feet of Jesus, for just loving us. Man, I know some of you have had a week, you know what I'm saying? When you've had a week, and then you come in the doors in this church, and you feel the love of Jesus. Don't you just need that? We need that every day. You know, some days I don't, I don't feel, I honestly don't feel like I walk in that. And some days I just don't feel like I've got confidence. You with me? Have you, have you ever felt like I just, I just don't have confidence? Um, I have walked in the grocery store before. My wife has given me a list. Any married men in the room know where I'm going? I had all the confidence in the world. She's like, hon, hey, you just need to get a few things get a few things, and I've made a list. You don't have to think about it. I got a list right here, and I go to the store, and I look at the list, and I look at those three items. Like, I, I don't know what that is, and uh, I go into the store trying to be a good husband and thinking, well, it's just three things, right? It, it can't be that hard, and then I, I catch myself going down this aisle, and then then back around, and I do the whole circle thing. Any, any fellas in the room ever done just, you've done laps before, you know what I'm talking about. You're just doing the laps. And uh, I, I start losing my confidence, and then I start leaning into prayer, like God, like it can't be that hard. Like you, you made this world. I mean, you could answer, you could help a brother out. Can you reveal to me where this is? And so, you know what God has always provided in my uncertainties and there's always a, a grandma in the grocery store just at that time. And praise the Lord for that grandma who can point me out. She just looks at me. And in the South, she'd be like, oh, bless your heart. Like, <laughs> she'll point me in the right direction. But when I'm not confident, I, I tend to lean into the Lord and say, God, help. You know, I, I, I need you to point me into the right direction. I need to know that you're with me. But it's fascinating that on the other side of that spectrum, like if my wife gives me one thing on the list and it says ice cream, I know where that's at. And I go to the store with confidence. But you know what I don't do? I don't, I don't lean into the Lord for that. It's interesting that when I don't have confidence, I tend to pray more but when I do have self-confidence, believing that I could do something on my own, I tend to pray less. And I think we're kind of like that as human beings. We tend to err on the side of trying to be self-confident. We live in a world that tries to be self-confident. Well, last week we, we asked a question, and it really helps with this, and it helps with all kind of areas of life, decision-making, conflicts you might be in, whatever it may be, good or bad. And here it is. What would somebody in your circumstances do if they were absolutely confident that God is with them? What would someone do if they're absolutely confident that God is with them? Now, why would we ask a question this way? And we ask it this way because sometimes in your present reality, you're in a box and you don't see the real reality. And you kind of have to pull yourself out of it to have another viewpoint. Have you ever realized that sometimes when you're talking with your friends, you're giving them better advice than you give yourself? Has that ever happened to you? Sometimes you give better advice than you give yourself. A lot of times you can, you can see the speck. It's easier to see the speck in someone else's eye than it is the own plank in your own eye. So we have to get out of the box that we're in and look at it from another angle. And perhaps asking the question like this could, could help you out. What would I do in my fill in the blank if I was absolutely confident that God was with me? What would I do in my finances if I knew absolutely God was with me? What would I do in this situational conflict if I knew God was with me? What would I do if I had all the confidence in the world and I had great success and prosperity? What would I do if I knew God was with me, if I absolutely knew that? So this question, 
it helps us get a new lens. It gives us a new perspective on how to approach and how to respond no matter what happens to you in life. Good things, bad things, whatever it might happen. It gives us the ability to reshape our insecurities, to reformulate our tendencies to control or overreact or, or to reorient our response when temptation comes our way. When we ask ourselves this question, it, it, it serves as a great reminder, a reminder to know that I've got a heavenly Father who's with me in this moment, good or bad, catastrophic or a blessing, for richer or poorer, God is with me. So we're talking about Joseph. And I love the story of Joseph, the life event of Joseph. And what I love about it is that Joseph, he faces the most massive, extreme issues that you can imagine, probably way more than any of us combined would face. I mean, that guy was, was, was left for dead, and his brothers lied about him, and then they sold him to be a slave, right? And then, as he was a slave in a foreign land in Egypt, then he gets lied about by his master's wife, and she accused him of rape. And so he gets thrown into to prison, and then he gets forgotten about in prison. What a life. But today, the story shifts. His life shifts. And today, everything turns around for prosperity. So he was in a position of poverty, a position of need, of loneliness, of desperation. And now things are going to turn as we look into today's story. He gets an opportunity to have as much wealth, more than he could ever imagine. I mean, it's, think about it. It's like getting 10 or 10 times the lottery ticket value. I don't know. <laughs> He's going to have the opportunity for wealth and to even possibly get revenge on those that hurt him. But what surprises me the most about Joseph and his life is how he responds to life, whether it's a dire situation or a great situation. But many of us have been very blessed in this room. I, I, I would imagine most of us drove to church today. And most of us were healthy enough to at least walk in or have someone help us walk in. And we're so blessed. We're so blessed to just be in this country, to, to come in here and worship freely. Isn't that amazing? I love it. We're so blessed. But how does someone who has been as blessed as you've been blessed live their life as if God's with them? Wealth and prosperity, more so than need and poverty, have the potential to pull us away from faith in God. So how do you have confidence in God? How do you have faith in God when everything's going your way and when there's favor in you? How do you have faith then? Let's pick up the story of Joseph and see how Joseph responds. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 41, verse 1. When two full years have passed, Pharaoh had a dream. All right, we're going to pause already. Just let this sink a little bit. Two pages ago, that was two years ago. This is two years. Two years this guy was forgotten about in prison. When we're reading the Bible, and when you're reading Scripture, and you flip a page, you know, that doesn't take but a second. But this was two years. One page term for us, two years for this guy. And by the way, Joseph knew God was with him, but in that whole two years of being alone in a prison cell, Nothing extraordinary happened. God was silent. There was no big God moment. God, don't you see me here? Don't you see? My family forgot about me. My, my brother sold me here, and I'm stuck in here, and the guy who got out, he forgot about me. Now I'm here completely alone. Don't you see me? Two years. How many of us get impatient with God in two seconds? I prayed right now. I prayed in your name, and it didn't happen my way. Well, what happens when you're praying and it doesn't turn out the way you prayed for it and it doesn't turn out the way and the timing that you prayed for it? It's God's timing. 
13 years Joseph had been in Egypt. And now two of these years he was forgotten about in prison. Separated from family, he was a slave thrown in prison. I can't imagine just the loneliness that Joseph felt, even from God. Maybe he knew God was with him, but man, can you imagine how he felt? That was a long time. So Pharaoh has a dream. In the next few verses, Pharaoh dreams about these cows. What an interesting dream. So there's these healthy cows, seven, and they're eating reeds. And then all of a sudden, these seven other sickly, skinny, deprived-looking cows, they appear. And then they come and they eat the other cows. Well, this startles Pharaoh. And Pharaoh wakes up. And he realizes, oh, thank goodness, that's just a dream, because that would be terrifying, cows eating cows. I thought they were herbivores. And he goes back to sleep. He has another dream. And now it's a dream about wheat. And so this wheat plant grows up, the stalk grows, and it has seven healthy heads of grain on it. And then he sees these seven unhealthy heads of grain appear, and those seven unhealthy grains consume the healthy ones. Now that scares him again. He wakes up. And he's so, Pharaoh is so startled by this, he calls in all the nation's magicians and wise men. I mean, this, he's not a Christian, so he's, he's calling in anyone he knows that's got some kind of smarts to come in and help him with this dream. Let's pick up here in verse 9. Then the chief cupbearer, that's the guy who, who, who forgot about Joseph. He was in prison with Joseph, then he left him. The chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. Thank God for reminders. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain guard, we told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. And when Joseph had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Isn't that strange? Why would, why would Joseph shave just pause there a second. I want to point something out here. Have you ever noticed that Egyptians are depicted as bald? Did you know that Egyptians hated hair? They literally just shaved it all. They hated hair. In fact, if you are follically challenged in the room today, you would be considered a high up in the Egyptian society. They hated hair. Hated it. Well, that's not, a, that's not a Hebrew thing. You know, that wasn't a Joseph thing. That's not like where he's from. I mean, they had beards and such. Um, but Joseph disregarded his own personal preference because he honored God, and he knew something. Joseph knew that the way you honor others is a reflection of how you honor God. And Joseph honored God, so his preferences were nothing to him. So he shaved everything, to go and be honorable to the Pharaoh, his authority. Let's pick up here. Verse 15, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Pharaoh said, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Can you imagine if that was you? The, the ruler of the nations the biggest nation in the world, and he comes up to you. He's like, I got a problem, and no one on earth can fix it, but you can. You've got the answer. Can you imagine how that would make you feel? Oh, man, this is my moment, baby. This is it. This guy can, has the future in my hands. All I got to do is tell him I got you. I got this ability. I'm going to help you out. Uh, can you imagine the pressure that must be, though? Like, man, what if I say something wrong? Have you ever wondered that? What if I get it wrong? What if I look him in the eye too much and he feels awkward or, you know? What, what if I blow the moment? What if I mess it all up? A lot of pressure. I better not say anything dumb. I better get it right. I better say something that he would want me to say, something that he would want me to hear. Isn't it fascinating that in moments like these, we have this temptation 
this pull, this prideful tug, that when we are tempted like this, we want to disregard our own values or insert flattery or embellishment or just chuck faith at the door and just live in the moment and lift up yourself. It's a temptation. But in moments like these, ask the question, what does someone who is confident that God was with them do when they are in environments like these? Take yourself out of the equation. This is a good moment, but don't get caught up in all the pizzazz. Don't get caught up in that opportunity. Remember to take yourself out of it and look at it. If God was with me, what would he have me do? If my confidence was in him, not in myself. Check out what Joseph, Joseph says, his response. This is how he responds. He says, I can't do it. But God can do it, and God will give Pharaoh what he desires. Wrong answer, dude. You don't tell the guy who owns it all, who came, searched the world and came to you, and now you're saying, I can't do it. And much less, you don't give someone who doesn't know about the Almighty God and bring in some kind of church answer and say, I can't do it, but he can do it. And this guy, Pharaoh, thinks he is God. The whole nation thinks Pharaoh is God. And now Joseph's saying, I can't do it, but God can. How offensive is that to Pharaoh? That hit him right in the pride spot, man. Hit him right where it hurt. But Joseph stayed faithful in his response. Pharaoh said to Joseph, oh, excuse me, Look at Joseph's integrity here. He says, I can't do it. It's not my ability. It's an ability God has given. Joseph had an opportunity to take credit for something he could do, but he didn't do it. He didn't steal the credit. He gave God all the credit. What happens when it's your moment to shine? Who gets the glory? Do you get the glory or do you give all the glory to God? Joseph gave it all to the Lord. You don't do what Joseph did in a moment like that unless you were confident that God is with you. Let's pick up in verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years and the seven heads of grain are seven years. It's one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up after the seven are, are seven years. And, are, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. Have you ever been at a point in your life where whatever it is you're going through is so severe you don't even remember the good old days? That's what's happening right here. And the reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that it's a, mat it's a matter that has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. If you're ever wondering if God is trying to speak something to you, he's probably saying it again and again and again. It's probably on repeat. God was speaking something to Pharaoh, and it was on repeat. And Joseph shares his understanding of these dreams to Pharaoh. God allows Joseph this ability and wisdom and insight to know what to say and know what the dreams actually mean. But then Joseph takes it a step further. And this is where I think it gets a little bit scary. Joseph, this prisoner, has guts enough to stand before the ruler. And then in the next few verses we're about to read, he starts giving him advice. This prisoner is giving the ruler of the land some advice. What's he think? Is this guy nuts? What would you do? Do you think you're in a position to do that? 
this guy's crazy. But you know what? This is the kind of audacious faith men and women have when they are absolutely confident that God is with them. That's the kind of faith. Joseph never gave in to the lie that his future was in his hands. And he never gave in to the lie that his future was in Pharaoh's hands. His future was confidently held in the hands of his God. Do you have that confidence today? Or are you putting your confidence in your own hands, in your own abilities? Or is it in the success? Or is it in God? He dared, Joseph dared to speak the truth, even if it cost him his life. He dared to do something that would fail without divine intervention because he knew no matter what the outcome is, God is first. Regardless of what's going to happen, he could have lost his life. Doesn't matter. I honor God first. Even if I'm talking to the guy who thinks he's God, I'm going to honor God. Let's pick it up again. Verse 33. Now let Pharaoh, Joseph continues, let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by famine. I just, what an audacious thing to do. Telling a prisoner, telling this ruler, here's the game plan. Here's what you're going to do. I I think Joseph, is he either has to be crazy or he's got to have some godly guts. You know what I'm saying? He's got some kind of divine courage to speak up like this to the ruler of the land. It's not like Joseph was in prison for those last two years and he was thinking about that this moment was going to happen. Joseph didn't know what was going to happen. He wasn't trying to formulate, what am I going to say when this time comes or anything like that. No, he, he, he had to say these words on the fly. He had to say these words under pressure. He had to say these words just in a moment of, of extreme, uh, man, pressure from, being, from the ruler. Of the, of the known world. But you know, when God is with you, he gives you the words to say and the timing in which to say them. I'm reminded of a New Testament verse. This is in Luke chapter 12, verse 12. It says that the Holy Spirit will teach you at the right time the things you ought to say. God was with Joseph. And because God was with Joseph, because Joseph was so confident God was with him, he knew that in the moment he could speak truth, even if it was to the ruler of Egypt. God provided him with a plan. He didn't just, God didn't just reveal the problem. God revealed the plan. And your present problems may be God's plan for your future provision. So don't disregard the problems that you're facing. Let's pick up in verse 37. This plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, Can we find anyone like this man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and as wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with the respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride a chariot in a chariot as his second in command, and the people shouted before him, Make way! Thus he put Joseph in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift a hand or foot in all of Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name zaphnath paneah and gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt, and he was 30 years old when he entered the service of the king. When Joseph 
look back into the past. His needs didn't strip him of faith. When he, he passed the test of poverty. And now, when he is prosperous, he passed the test of prosperity. Because now, uh, it, it wasn't the, all the things that he had. His prosperity didn't push out his faith. His needs didn't strip him of his faith. His prosperity didn't push away faith. Joseph simply did what someone would do if they were absolutely confident that God was with them. You know, it's very difficult each and every day that we live and we have all of our needs met. It's incredibly difficult to have faith and depend upon the Lord when our needs aren't so obvious, isn't it? The test of prosperity is passed by far fewer people than the, than the test of poverty. Very few people, very few can live as if God is with them when things are going well. That's really tough to admit that this isn't by my hand, this isn't by my blessing, not by my strength, but because God has allowed me to have this. I simply steward all that he has given to me. It really all belongs to him. It's hard for people to live in faith in God when they have so much because prosperity lends hard against our sense of dependency. I heard a week ago, a week or so ago, uh, I was at a conference and I, I heard a story about a man born in China. He came to know Jesus and his church in China was under heavy oppression by the local authorities. And so they had to meet in secret so they wouldn't be pulled away from their families or put in a slammer or, or something even worse. So he had to meet secretly. But he loved God. He loved Jesus. Jesus really changed his life. And we're all about changed lives here at Woodland. Jesus changing lives. Jesus changed this man's life. And he couldn't get enough of worshiping Jesus with his brothers and sisters, even if he had to walk a long, long way for hours, have to meet at 4 a.m. in the morning, had to meet underground or somewhere secret, he wasn't going to stop gathering together to worship the Lord and the Master who saved his life for eternity. When something happened to this man, he got an opportunity to come to America. And he, he got to come to America and he was overjoyed that there's no persecution happening here. Like, I can just worship God freely. And as often as he did, like, I, he went to a congregation every day of the week. Because he was so overjoyed that he could finally worship Jesus without the threat of his life on the line. Every day he was overjoyed. I can't believe I get to do this. What an amazing, blessed country this is. And then as time went on, he started making more income, got more blessed financially, more wealth coming in. And so he's, he started working a lot more. And so he, instead of going every day, he, he went to just one day. Well, I'm, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm going to worship God with, with the people of God one day. And then he started, he realized, he, he said, you know, if I, if I worked even harder and even more, I can make even more money. I can do even more things that I want to do. And eventually... The same man who, was over, who would do anything to worship Jesus in a communist country is now not even associating with the gathering of the people of God. All in pursuit of prosperity. And he lost his way. The test of prosperity is way more difficult than the test of poverty. So how do you keep the right perspective? How do you pass the test I think you have to declare your dependence. Be humble enough that no matter what the situation is, even if I'm extremely blessed to declare your dependence, I can't do it. It's only God in me, giving God his proper place. Joseph said to Pharaoh, when a moment where it didn't matter to Pharaoh if it was God through him or what, Pharaoh didn't care about that. Joseph could have said, yep, that's my gift. I'm good at it too. And Pharaoh would have still hired him. But Joseph had to say, it's not me. 
I can't do it. He declared dependence on God. Only God can do it. If the thought of declaring dependency makes you cringe a little bit, you're probably in trouble. (laughs) Because here's what I know about you, because I'm with you. (laughs) If you were in trouble, you would pray to God. If you were sick, you would turn to God and pray. If your children were sick, I guarantee it, you're going to get on your knees and start praying to God. If there's a terrible situation, you're going to be praying. But when things are good, maybe the finances are coming in, maybe things are going smooth, maybe it's been a long time since you hit a rut in the road, are you turning to God with the same spiritual intensity as you once were when you had to be dependent on him for that need in your life? That's a hard test. It's difficult. And if you're someone in this room and you fail that test, good news is we all do. We all fail that test. I failed it at the grocery store over ice cream. I mean, just the amount of times we don't pass that in any given day, just how blessed we are because God loves you so much. He loves you so much that even when you screw up, He still wants to give you breath in your lungs. He still wants to put that person in your life that will forgive you or someone, a a good friend that will point you along the right way, a a word of encouragement, a loving church like Woodland here who will just come alongside of you and love you through it. Would you be that unique person today that that would personally and publicly declare your dependence on God? You know, Jesus himself had 132 public appearances. 122 of those were in a workplace environment. Jesus Jesus spoke 52 parables, and 45 of those parables were about a workplace scenario, public scenes. And Jesus himself, the Son of the living God, eternal, He said these words in John 5, 19. Very truly I tell you, Jesus says, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing. In other words, Jesus says, I can't do it alone. But with God, I can do everything. If Jesus himself says, I can't do it, but I know he can, then who are we? We're going to be saying that all the more. We definitely need, if the Son of God has to say that, then we definitely got to say that. I can't do it. But with God, I know that I can. You pass the test of prosperity when you leverage what you have to others. When you leverage what you have to others. Joseph didn't do the work for himself. See, when he got that promotion, when all that prosperity came in, Joseph didn't hoard all that for himself. He started serving the very people that enslaved him. He started serving the people that lied about him. Joseph became this great ruler, and now he is helping the people that wanted to hurt him, that forgot about him. It makes no sense. This is the kind of stuff you do when you're absolutely certain that God is with you. It takes faith. God did not bless me because of me. And God does not bless me for me. God blessed blessed me to bless others. You have been made in God's image not just to bless him, but to also bless others. You have been made to bless others. You are a blessing to others. And how do I keep perspective? We keep perspective by remembering where you came from and where you are today. Think about just a moment where you've been. Just just take a look back real quick in your own life. Have you seen God's hand in your life, even right now, just the breath in your lungs. Think about where you've been and where you are today. 
and what God has pulled you through. Maybe what he's still pulling you through, but you know he's with you. In verse 50, before the years of the famine came, Joseph had two sons. And Joseph remembered God. And he, he, he honored God by naming his children this. His first son he named Manasseh. And it means because God has made me forget all of my trouble. He named his second son Ephraim, which means because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. The very place where I thought I was ruined, suffering, trouble, was the very place God anointed to bring blessing in my life. It's the very place God wants to bring blessing in your life. Don't disregard your problems because God's got a plan for you and his plan is to bring you life. His plan is not to harm you. His plan is to bless you and his plan is for you to be that blessing to others. So I want to ask you this question one more time. Would you, what would you, what would somebody in your circumstances do if they were absolutely confident that God was with them? And what will you do? Pray with me. Father, today we just ask to help us remember that you are with us. We admit and we confess that we depend on you. For you are the God who never fails. Our strength will fail. Our confidence will fail. But you are the God who never fails. You make no mistakes. You bless us and you choose us to be a blessing to others. Help us this day to trust in you like never before. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.